Joe Pelgizzo here. I have spoken at length about what it was like living in Hollywood in the heyday of the Sunset Strip era, 1987 to 1992, the so-called Guns N' Roses era. I've often likened it to ancient Rome for all its decadence, the debauchery, the total f***ing fun of it all. How your old pal Gizzo rose from rags to riches in the most competitive arena of all. Rock music. It was awesome. But there was also the darker side. Where there was glory, there was also humiliation. Where there was decadence, there was also addiction. I rode that crazy wave like a champ, and while doing so, experienced the whole thrill of it all. And at the very same time, a lot of my rock and roll buddies flat out crashed and burned. How is this possible? Drugs, hard drugs, harder drugs, booze, or maybe they just weren't good enough to succeed, or strong enough, or resilient enough to withstand the pressure. I've spoken about the good times, and there were many, but what about the people who just plain old f things up? What about them? They have stories too, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention just a few. So here we go. I knew a local LA band that drank too much. Hell, we all drank too much. We hailed to Dionysus. We hailed to Bacchus, the Roman god. But these guys, they kind of drank harder than everyone else. They partied hard. They were out there every night at the rainbow, dressed to the nines, drinking it up, living the dream. They didn't have money, but boy, they lived it, man. Carpe diem. Anyway, the band got an opportunity to do a small four-show tour of Texas, so they jumped at the chance. The four of them threw their shitty equipment in their shitty van, and off they went. Rock and roll, baby! The tour was going splendidly until the third show when one of the guys died of alcohol poisoning. He actually drank himself to death on their very first tour. Wow, that's fucking commitment. What were they supposed to do? They were stuck in Texas, a thousand miles away from home. So <laughs> believe it or not, they literally wrapped their dead band member up in a hotel blanket and drove back home to Hollywood with their pal in the back seat. They didn't want to deal with the Texas authorities. You know what? We'll just pretend this never happened and we'll drop them off at home. It took them two days to get back home. So I imagine there wasn't a whole lot of small talk driving along the way. I hope they had good air conditioning. Two whole days of lamentations and fermentations. Booze. Booze. Beer, wine, whiskey, you're the devil. I've done my share of it. I admit it. I've lived and I've loved and I've driven when I shouldn't. And luckily, luckily, I never harmed a soul. Nary a scratch after multiple combat missions. May the gods intervene, but I never razzled anyone. But what if your drug of choice was Coke or crack? What if someone in your band was a crackhead? I imagine that would suck. Crack is whack, as Whitney Houston once said, and she would know. I remember a story of a famous band who was scheduled to do an MTV video shoot at SIR Studios in Hollywood. Four of the guys showed up dutifully, but one guy didn't. Where was the fifth guy? Tick tock, tick tock. Minutes turned into hours. The record company started screaming at the guys, where's your boy? So the band quickly dispatched two of their crew guys to the guy's apartment. They knocked on the front door, bang, 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 bang. No answer. So one of the crew guys walked around to the front window and he looked inside and lo and behold, there was your boy in the middle of the room, sitting on a chair in the dark, smoking, chattering like a chimp. Uh, the crew guys banged on the window. Open the door, dude, open the door. To no avail. He wouldn't answer. He just sort of sat there silently, squirming, freaking out, locked up, jaws, can't talk, can't move. They had to get the building manager to take the front door off the hinges of his apartment to get inside. <laughs> wow! They pulled the guy off his chair and threw him in the cold shower with his clothes on, like Martin Sheen in Apocalypse Now. They dressed him up, threw some mirror sunglasses on him, and raced him to the video shoot. Whew! 
Talk about the heart of darkness. I heard another story about a band in Hollywood that had a crackhead bass player. The guy would routinely disappear for days on end. No phone calls, nothing. He'd blow off band rehearsals, recording sessions. It didn't matter. No one knew where he was when he pulled his Houdini act, not even his girlfriend. It seemed that any time the band had a major commitment, you know, making a record or making a video, something important, the guy would just ghost them. So they kept calling the guy's cell phone over and over and over. And it kept going to voicemail for days on end until finally, after the hundredth call, somebody answered. Hello? Hello? Phil? Phil? Are you there? A foreign voice sort of answered on the other end. Hello? Phil? 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 Yes, yes. This is Phil's phone, right? We want to talk to Phil. Where's Phil? Phil is in bed with me. What? He, uh, uh, what's he doing in bed? Uh, what do you think he's doing? We are in bed together. Well, what a twist. Turned out not only was their bass player a crackhead, but he was also gay. Not that there's anything wrong with it. Then his phone hung up. Click. Ha. <laughs> Then things got worse. How could they get any worse, you ask? Well, let me tell you. Two hours later, the band got a call from their missing bandmate's girlfriend screaming and crying. We need a thousand dollars. I need to give them a thousand dollars or they're going to kill him. What? What are you talking about? Kill who? It seemed that her crackhead boyfriend owed a couple of gang members a bunch of money for some crack he got on loan, and now they were banging down the door of the crack hotel he was staying in, with a male hooker, no less. So the gang members eventually broke down the door, and they grabbed the guy's cell phone, and they started yelling at the girlfriend. They demanded that she drive over with the money, or they were going to kill him. And to prove their point, they began to pistol whip the bass player, Live, right through the phone. <clears throat> ow! <clears throat> ow! <clears throat> ow! But she didn't have the money. The band didn't have the money. No one had the money. So instead of getting the money, they just beat the shit out of him and they took his car. Wow! He showed up for rehearsal a few days later with two black eyes, yeah, denying the incident ever happened. And the moral of the story is, I think Junkyard said it best. That's life in Hollywood! You know, people have been known to f up tours. It does happen. A band we all know had a much coveted opening slot on a major tour in the 90s until it was discovered that the band's bass player was sleeping with the wife of the headliner's lead singer. Stupid is as stupid does, Jenny. Tour dates, poof, gone. Bass player fired, poof, gone. There's also been many documented cases of band guys that just don't show up at the airport for the start of a major tour. You know, where's so-and-so? How can he do this to us? Oh, don't worry about him. He's fine. He's just chilling out. He's hanging out on this crummy couch in his garage in the dark, cracked out of his mind. Jaws locked up, can't speak, f***ing up his world and yours. Can you imagine how f***ing disrespectful that is to your band guys, your brothers in arms? It seems totally crazy, but it does happen. It's just harder to cover up now because of the internet. You know when you see a band cancel a gig or a tour due to health problems, you gotta wonder, what's really going on? One time, I got a call from a famous band's manager asking me if I was interested in singing for this famous band. So famous, in fact, that he couldn't even tell me what the name of the band was. You know, well, what's wrong with their singer, I asked. Health problems. Oh, health problems, got it. After 10 minutes or so of questioning, I finally got the truth. The band's lead singer was dead. He was dead, he OD'd. Now I'm a fairly liberal fellow, but death is a pretty hard thing to bounce back from. Or maybe people are just unlucky. You know, I say that, but we all know people make their own luck in this business. If you have a major record company showcase, it probably isn't a good idea to go on a drinking binge and scream at your girlfriend all night the night before. 
or stay up all night smoking crack and then show up at the band showcase looking like you just came out of the video for bum fights. Record company people aren't totally smart, but they're also not totally stupid either. And you might just have f***ed up that one break you've been working for all your life. There have been a lot of successful musicians who are secret heroin guys, but there's also a million guys who never made it because they were heroin guys. I've been to parties, creepy parties, where I've seen people shooting up and freaked me out. It freaked me out. Needles freaked me out. I'm a boozer, man. Baby, I'm the boozer. I come from a long line of boozers. Charles Bukowski, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, Dr. Seuss. It's important to have perspective in life. To be able to see yourself honestly and learn from your mistakes, man. There was and there still is a dark side to Hollywood. There's drugs and there's bondage and there's despair and degradation. But there's also the shining lights of success and payoff for years of pushing that f***ing stone up the hill. Many are called, but few are chosen. And some get to play music, like me. It's Ropel Gizzo, rock and rollin', and we'll see you next time.